Oh, it looks like we're live on TV here. Welcome to the Growing Concern. We've got a guest with us tonight, uh, Zahir Wahab, who's just back from, uh, from Afghanistan. This is our first program that we're going to try to stream. And uh, if this works out and looks like it is, uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, put that uh, URL up, that link up, next week. And uh, maybe folks can, uh, you're watching on TV, you don't need to watch it streaming. But, but uh, pass the word around. I just got the word, it's streaming. So. Uh, uh, thank to Frank Mahoney, our, our wonderful director, that he's getting this up on the air, and uh, I guess I should say on the uh, internet. And now this this is, will be out available as well as uh, as on the cable access, public access uh, cableways. It'll be on the internet as well, just like the the Cannabis Common Sense show that comes on right after us. All right, so we'll get, we'll get on with the program. As I hear, Wahab is a professor at Lewis and Clark, and he goes to Afghanistan every year and works with the what is the Department of, of uh, Ministry of Higher Education, of higher education um, right. and especially in teacher education. Mm -hmm. And then you come back and he comes on, our, he's wonderful, he comes on our program and gives us an update on this. And uh, it, it's uh, a little bit different than what you're going to get on MSNBC and CNN, let alone Fox. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about his experiences there and, uh, and what exactly he's doing over there. So you're working for the Ministry of Education, so you must be, you're not teaching, but you're probably working to try to provide education across the board. Actually, uh, thank you for having me, Jim. Oh, you um, bet. Uh, as you know, I have been going uh, to Afghanistan um, for the last eight years. It's been eight spending. Years. Yeah, I began um, going there in 2002, and for the first five years, I was serving as advisor to the Ministry of Higher Education, uh, trying to rebuild and reconstruct uh, higher education in general in the country. Uh, the last two years, uh, what we did was uh, to establish a program uh, with assistance from the uh, U.S. government and taxpayers and U of Mass, um, establish a master's degree program, the first and only master's degree program to train and retrain teacher education faculty. Uh, there are 16 uh, four-year teacher training colleges in Afghanistan, and the vast majority of their instructors who teach in the teacher education colleges only have bachelor's degrees, and, you know, they received their education some time ago. Mm -hmm. So these people need to sort of upgrade and update uh, their uh, training, uh, both in terms of content but also pedagogy, uh, teaching skills, and so forth. So this program we established about two years ago, uh, it's a four-semester program, a master's degree program, uh, 32 uh, credit hours. And I was instrumental in, um, had a part in both designing the program, in the, but also designing five of the 12 courses in the program. So I've taught five of the, the courses in the program. And we actually just graduated this last Christmas, uh, the first group of uh, uh, 22 men and women, 11 men, 11 women. We have a second group, and then there will be a third group beginning uh, March 21st. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing. There are two ministries in Afghanistan dealing with education. One is the Ministry of Education, which deals with uh, K through 12th grade. So uh, among younger grades. And then the other, yes, the, the pre-collegiate. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Ministry of Higher Education, which deals with the 21-22 uh, uh, public institutions of, of higher learning. So that's what I've been doing and then, you know, trying to design the courses, develop the material, translate the material and teach the classes and mentor the, the people in the program. Before we get off into what the rest of the country looks like, do you have books and, and uh, classrooms and all that? Um, it's very, very difficult, Jim, uh, and unfortunately this has been one of the problems uh, when the United States uh, and its... Uh, coalition of the willing decided to invade and occupy the country in October 2001. Uh, the emphasis was on the, the counterinsurgency, uh, counterterrorism, quote unquote, and, and war. And there has been very little reconstruction uh, over the last uh, nine years uh, in agriculture, in education, in healthcare, in uh, transportation, and so forth. Uh, they're just beginning to pay attention to uh, education and um, to training of the, the labor force. Uh, so uh, the Afghan government, as you can imagine now, Afghanistan is the, um, toward the very bottom in terms of the poverty and underdevelopment mm -hmm. and, quote, backwardness. It's just above Niger, actually, in, in terms of uh, development. Is it above uh, or below Nigeria? Uh, uh, well, it's so just, above, say, it's the just Niger, above Niger. Yeah. Niger. Uh, 
Um, so it's a poor country. The government budget, the whole government budget, is about $800 million. And 90% of the budget comes from uh, foreign assistance. The government can only generate about 10% of its own budget. Uh, the GDP for the whole country is about $12 billion. The point is that uh, there have been estimates that uh, the country can spend about maybe $400 per year per college student. That's it. For, that's for everything, you know. Uh, books, salaries, classrooms, electricity, water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's and for a whole. Estimate. That's for a whole semester. Then. That's for a whole year. A whole year. Per year, you know. Here you could spend that much money on a book. On a book. On yeah, a good that's book. Right. That's right. Uh, and it's estimated that you know, the country can spend about forty dollars per year per child between the first grade and twelfth grade. So you know, education has been neglected, like a lot of other uh, aspects of life, because uh, on the other hand, you know, the United States spends about five to six billion dollars a year now, uh, uh, a month, on, mm -hmm. on war. And there are 40 other countries who also, of course, spend a certain amount of money on war. So you can imagine, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent every day on war, uh, chasing phantom uh, Qaeda and phantom terrorists and so forth. Uh, it's essentially actually fighting uh, a nationalist insurgency movement, but very little on development. You know, that's interesting. You say forty dollars per child, uh, per child, and four hundred dollars per regular yeah. student. Yes. But haven't I heard that it, this this figure might have been for Iraq, but it might be for Iraq and Afghanistan. It, or a soldier over there is a is a million dollars a year. That's for Afghanistan, and this is the Congressional Research Division, which came up with the estimates here um, that the United States spends each soldier, American soldier, costs us one point two million dollars per year when you consider all the costs. Um, and people like Stiglitz from Columbia University and others, uh, economists, have estimated that the Afghanistan war has uh, cost us total uh, about a, a trillion dollars so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no end in sight. You know, the war uh, looks like it's going to continue. It's escalating, yes. Yes, escalated and uh, being expanded and, uh, and deepened. You know, that $1.2 million, now that, that is for a, an enlisted soldier. Yes. Now we're paying $100,000 a month or more for these black, black water, black, black heart, water. black water, I guess. Yes. And th that probably is a whole, is, is that a different budget? So well, it's interesting. Um, we now have, the United States and its allies um, has 113,000 soldiers, officially. Mm -hmm. But there are also 104,000 contractors, which would include people like um, Blackwater, uh, DynCorp, uh, Armed Group, Armor Group, uh, North America. Uh, and there are in the 104 Shadow Army, which we pay for. You know, we pay for both of them. Um, there are about 15,000 Americans and 15,000 third country people. The rest of them are Afghans. So that's also an army, you know, they provide the security, they do the laundry, they do this and that, mm -hmm. that people don't know about. In other words, um, on the one hand, Jim Jones, the national security advisor, tells us that uh, at best there are perhaps 100 Qaeda in Afghanistan. Uh, on the other hand, we have 113,000 officially, you know, designated army, but also 104,000 shadow army, but we also have about 200,000 Afghan national security forces, the army, the police, and intelligence. So in other words, uh, we have about 400,000 troops that we pay for because we pay for the <sighs> Afghan army too. I never looked at chasing, it like that. <laughs> chasing, you know, maybe allegedly, supposedly, uh, 100 Qaeda and maybe a couple of thousand uh, Talib. But Taliban, the issue is more yeah. complicated because it's not just a few hundred, a few thousand Talibs because it's essentially really a national liberation movement against its resistance against the occupation. Uh, and, and the Taliban really sort of intersect with the Pashtun population, which constitute about 55 percent of the population or 15 million. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the, the major fighters over there aren't Al-Qaeda or, or Taliban, although you keep hearing that Taliban is, is starting to take over. It's basically insurgency against an occupying force, which happens to be us at this time. Yes, it's very complicated. I think it's too simplistic to reduce everything to the, these Taliban who are backward and medieval, etc., uh, you know, uh, against the United States. Uh, the Afghanistan situation is very, very complicated because there are all kinds of groups fighting for their own reasons. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's certainly a, a, a sort of a, a resistance movement, and not just amongst the Pashtuns or the Taliban, uh, but they're all over the country because right now there's fighting going on all over the country, uh, not just the south and southeast, but also in the north and west and other parts. And other groups also are resisting both the central government and the occupation forces because people don't like being occupied. So you have the drug mafia fighting, f creating instability for its own reasons. Mm -hmm. You have different groups fighting. You have the NAB, essentially the mainstream resistance movement to the occupation. And you have sort of proxy wars between India and Pakistan, for example, or Iran and the United States, or Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and Iran. Uh, you know, you have these other groups. Uh, you have Hizb Islami, you have Haqqani. So it's very complicated. It's not very, very simple. It's too simplistic and it's wrong to reduce everything to uh, the United States, the good people trying to enlighten and, and liberate, uh, you know, the women mm -hmm. from the, these uh, medieval talib. Uh, essentially, it really is, uh, you know, a sort of a, a national resistance against the occupation. But also, remember what was happening uh, in October 2001. There was a civil war underway in Afghanistan between the Pashtun population, which constitutes about more than half the population, in the so-called Northern Alliance, which was made right. up of different groups. So there was a civil war going on. The Taliban were part of the Pashtun. The United States decided to intervene on behalf of the Northern Alliance and dislodge the Pashtuns and the Taliban from the government and positions of power. Uh, and the United States and its allies continue to sort of be supportive of the Northern Alliance because the Northern Alliance really are the people who have the power, the privileges, you know, the positions, the access to this and that. And the Pashtuns have been sort of marginalized. So the civil war continues and the United States it has intervened on the side of, say, a coalition of the minorities against the majority population without trying to reconcile between these groups. And so I'm afraid that the U.S. presence in Afghanistan um, is exacerbating the conditions and deepening the ethnic cleavages and ethnic tension mm -hmm. that would resurface as soon as the Americans leave. You know, I've just recently read a, 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 a magazine, The Nation, that did a yeah. whole, a whole uh, range of articles on that. Yeah. And they were talking about, you might have caught that, how they were talking Yesterday about Kar Karzai, whatever, yeah. is either a Pashtun or a Northern Alliance. And uh, they have emphasized yeah. and really and created, the, made the problem much worse by him being there. Well, because uh, he he is there's a lot of the nation that are against him, and then you add the corruption yes. that we hear about. Well, uh, the United States is not helping itself at all by associating itself with the existing government. Uh, Karzai and company were, of course, really identified by the Americans, the UN, and the European Union in December 2001. Um, you know, he was selected and installed by the United States and Europe in the he's UN. He's a Pashtun. Uh, yeah, he is a Pashtun, a nominal Pashtun, but he works for himself and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, the, his brother is, uh, according to the New York Times, his brother is the major drug uh, trafficker in the country. Mm -hmm. And his family and relatives have become very, very wealthy because they've appropriated, you know, public lands, public uh, enterprises, and the drug thing, you know. so. The Karzai government, um, you know, was installed and is protected and defended by the United States. Uh, and there were two elections, the last one, of course, being last August 20th, um, which were notoriously fraudulent. I mean, the, this election was a farce and a sham. And yet the United States and the Europeans decided to uh, support uh, Karzai and uh, the, the existing government. But the Karzai government really has no legitimacy, it has no credibility. Uh, it was, so, it was ranked as the most corrupt uh, after, you know, Somalia in the world. Uh, yeah. It has not really delivered the goods and services that a government, you would expect a government. So the government has no credibility and now it has low, no legitimacy. And yet the United States has decided to continue supporting, protecting, arming and funding this kind of government. So he's bad for the United States and the United States is actually bad for him and that's why you know no government official in Afghanistan is safe anywhere in the country mm -hmm. and no foreigner is safe anywhere in the country no matter what your intentions and why you're there and who you are. Mm -hmm. Because people associate the two together and neither 
has any credibility or legitimacy and neither really is liked very much by the majority of the population. So you paint a real bleak picture about that. Well, it's pretty bad. Um, you know, yesterday there was also uh, on Fresh Air, um, um, Terry Gross had this guy who wrote uh, an article for the Nation magazine on corruption and how government, current U, uh, Afghan government officials and their children are involved in these multi-million dollar, uh, you know, protections and transportation and so forth. And the article essentially was that you and I actually pay millions of dollars to the Taliban so the Taliban would allow these, the U.S. Army and the people who provide them with, you know, essential material, protection money to go to, to travel. Mm -hmm. And it's very well documented and, and it was just incredible actually some of the things I knew but other things I learned yesterday, which is to say that there, is, uh, there are lobbyists, there are public relations firms in Washington and in Virginia who work very closely um, with the elite and ruling elite in Afghanistan and the U.S. government to expand and perpetuate the war because there are billions of dollars to be made. Blackwater is now bidding for a billion dollar contract to train the Afghan police force and the Afghan army. So there's a lot of money to be made. In other words, there are vested interests, you know, in death and destruction and wasting taxpayers' money. And, you know, so far 900 Americans have been killed since the beginning of this war. So basically what you're saying is even though we pretend to be doing, you know, trying to, trying to train the people and trying to do this and do that and, and bring democracy to them, what we are really doing over there is what you are telling us the place looks like. I mean, well, it, 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 works, it works to our agenda to have it $40 for the kid to have a, a year's worth of school and $400 to have a... That, that is really our plan because we have the power and we have the money to change that. So since we yes. don't, that must be what we want. Well, uh, you know, uh, I mean, government, for you, Afghan government figures and U.S. Uh, and U.N. Uh, figures, for example, um, document that Afghanistan is the poorest country. And in terms of human development index, it really ranks toward the very bottom, along with Haiti, Somalia, and Yemen, and, uh, you know, places like that. In terms of illiteracy, you know, child mortality, um, mm -hmm. calorie intake, uh, you name it. This is a country where the government, Af Afghan government, recently said that um, the uh, the poverty line is about 50 cents um, per day. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a country where about half the population live on a dollar a day and the other half live uh, on two dollars a day. But there's a, a tiny segment of the population which has gotten obscenely wealthy because of the war. War is, mm -hmm. you know, very profitable. In both and countries, apparently. In it's both, it's obviously. that way here, too. Yes, uh, but mm -hmm. if you look at the, the lives of the vast majority of the people, and I work with these people, you know, I lived amongst them, and um, desperate poverty. And it was interesting, uh, about two months ago, Oxfam did a survey in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. You know, Oxfam, a very credible organization, mm -hmm. and asked the, um, a sample of, I think, 1,500 people from throughout the country, saying what the people thought were the main difficulties in Afghanistan. And guess what? People said, first, poverty, second, unemployment, mm -hmm. third, government corruption and inefficiency. Well, that high, huh? Yes. Fourth, foreign meddling, fifth, the Taliban. This is what the majority of the people, according to the Oxfam uh, survey, indicate. In other words, people have more pressing problems. You know, right now, people are freezing, animals are freezing to death because of the cold weather. Uh, you know, people don't have enough to eat. Uh, there's not a single school or university in the country that has heating. And this is a, where, you know, it gets free, it's below cold, freezing. It's cold it in the gets very, Yeah, it's the Hindu Kush, you know. It's the, oh, that's right. The, yeah, it's the, the Hindu Kush. Yeah. But, you know, they can't provide essentials for people. Uh, but there's a class of people, as I said, that has gotten very, very wealthy. It just seems to me that, you know, in, in my mind, there's no excuse for that because well, it would take so little to provide some warm clothes and some food for those folks. Yes. Compared to the million dollars a year they're, they're spending to provide the soldiers with weapons. Yes. yes. Well, imagine, I mean, what you could do with $5 billion uh, in that country per month. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I keep saying that, why don't we just give so much money to each family and all of this war and violence <laughs> and lawlessness will end? Mm -hmm. Because when people have a house, when they have health care, they have education, they have food, they have work, most people don't choose 
to fight, you know, or create mischief mm -hmm. and end occupation. But also, many people have suggested that what needs to be done is really for the United States and NATO to withdraw, definitely have a timetable, and replace it with a UN peacekeeping force. The UN peacekeeping force will be much cheaper, it will be much more effective, it will be much safer for everybody, mm -hmm. and it will end the violence. I mean, this way, I think what is being done now is simply, uh, again, deepen the ethnic cleavages and uh, ethnic tensions, and someday that's going to resurface, uh, mm -hmm. and there will be nobody to, to sort of control that. You know, I was just thinking back, you know, the Russians uh, were in there, and uh, they got kicked out. Did they have to deal with these ethnic uh, tensions? You know, what they created, the Russians to some extent were responsible for creating, pitting this group over that group. You know that mm -hmm. Afghanistan is a very uh, diverse society. There are all kinds of languages, ethnicities, and, you know, two main religions, uh, Shiites and Sunnis, uh, and so forth. Um, people got along before the October uh, 78 coup, and then the Russians sort of um, created many of these these tensions they because the they, <laughs> they used this group against that group uh, and so um, so now we have this problem unfortunately the United States now is doing the same thing because it pays this group not to attack it's a, I think it's a known fact that the Americans the Germans the Italians and the French pay the insurgents and i.e. the Taliban not to attack them they mm -hmm. bribe these people the way they did it in Iraq, you right. see. Yeah, but also that. they have these um, civilian militias, so the United States try to uh, recruit people, civilians, you know, to, to, re to fight the Taliban, or, and then people don't like to do that because you don't like to fight your own people, the people you know, the people you live mm -hmm. with. So they will bring another group, of ethnic group from another part of the country, put them in this part of the group, in other words, bring the non-Pashtuns and put them in Pashtun villages and towns to control the population. So, so it's doing the same thing. In other words, the United States uh, is instrumental in, in deepening uh, ethnic tensions and you know, urban rural tensions instead of trying to forge uh, harmony and uh, mm -hmm. you know, getting along and, 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 and peace and reconciliation. They're simply creating tensions. They're creating it. And aren't we also doing something similar with the, with, with the drug trade? That rather well, than trying to stamp it out, it's become yeah. probably more than it was before. And, and uh, yes. are we just turning a blind eye to it, or is it possible that we're, we're more involved in it than that? Well, the drug we're, thing we're is very we're interesting. We're propping up the drug lords and the, and the warlords. Well, in a way, we're doing it. Again, uh, remember the Taliban actually almost eliminated uh, the drug business, and that's why um, Clinton rewarded the Taliban in 2001 and 2000, 2000 or 1999 because they had almost er eradicated the drug issue. But now it's, it provides, Afghanistan unfortunately provides 95% uh, of the, the heroin in the world. And, and we know for a fact, the Americans know, according to the New York Times and you know, US government, the Drug Enforcement Agency and State Department, that um, Karzai's own brother is the major drug trafficker. He also has been working for the CIA for the last eight years, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. But also, we know that some of the high government officials, ministers and governors and so forth, are up to here in the drug business. But because they help the United States and NATO, help them initially and now help them, you know, to fight the, the Taliban and the insurgency, they're okay. Um, it's well documented that, you know, the Karzai's brother, uh, again, is a drug trafficker, but also he works for the CIA, which is to say that the CIA has known all along mm -hmm. who the major drug traffickers are in the country. But because Ahmad Wali Karzai helps the CIA and the U.S. Special Forces against the Taliban, mm -hmm. he's okay, he's left alone. Furthermore, actually, um, Indian intelligence sources and the Russian intelligence sources and the Afghan Minister of Counter-Narcotics recently made statements to the press to the effect that elements of the U.S. forces are also involved in drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in Vietnam yeah. it was the same thing. Well, and in we the Central the America. Air America, you know? we were flying drugs in. Yes, yes, they do. They, uh, it has been said by credible sources that elements of the U.S., you know, maybe, uh, who knows, the CIA, the Army, the, you know, business people are involved in, in drug trafficking. But also, so you have about 
one and a half million drug addicts in Afghanistan, and there's very little you, that you can do to help them. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't have that amount of, but it's almost a third of the economy now because, again, there was very little um, redevelopment and reconstruction going on. So instead of the allies, the U.S., trying to, uh, you know, encourage and develop uh, the legitimate, legal, useful economy, they didn't pay attention to that, and people somehow have to make a living. And, you know, poppies are very low maintenance, they're very profitable, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what people do. Uh, but, the, you know, the side effect is that you have large numbers of men, women, and children addicted, Afghan children, mm -hmm. addicted to uh, narcotics. You know, there's a lot of parallels for this. The same thing is going on in in, uh, in uh, Colombia with cocaine. And, you know, as if my history serves me right, it seems to me that didn't, didn't the East India Tea Company or whatever yeah. involved with opium trade in order to get the tea? And so they, they, they made sure that a lot of people were addicted to uh, opium and brought large amounts of opium into China in order to get the tea out? Yes. And, well, and, and it, it seems to be a very uh, common government. Well, it's both, I think, uh, economic control. I mean, drugs, as you know, is there's a lot of money globally, mm -hmm. and all kinds of people, foreigners, are involved in the Afghan drug uh, trade too. But it's also a way to control the population. I mean, women and children, for example, in Afghanistan, uh, they would take you know uh, opium or give it to children because there's no other medicine, there's no health care, or children are hungry and crying, so mothers would give them um, poppy seeds, and so you have children made addicted, you know, on drugs because of the, the, the necessities. And I think maybe ruling elites find it um, very um, convenient to have large numbers of people, you know, either be afflicted with drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, so they, you know, they just uh, go to sleep and not bother uh, the governments or the ruling elites. Mm -hmm. No rebellion when people, you know. Right. I wonder what happened to our uh, I was, pictures. I was just thinking, you know, that uh -huh. we've talked a lot about yeah. the philosophy and what's going on in the yeah. country, and yeah. it would be good, good time to start looking yeah. at some pictures of uh, what the well, country really looks like. Uh, I have quite a few pictures. You, so you, these, these, are the, these are fresh pictures you brought yes. back from your yeah. last trip. Yeah, well, that's are, great. I'm always taking pictures, so yeah, we you take see a ton of them. <laughs> All right, yes. well, we'll get the graphics machine, getting them, some of them pictures up, and we'll just kind of work through them, and, and yeah. you can discuss a little bit. I remember that you always have pictures of the schools yeah. and the streets. and It's, uh, uh, you know, when you look at, I mean, in every way, the conditions are really, really bad. So this is sort of street life, you know, and it's getting cold, people trying to make a living. All right, so this, this is a fairly recent picture then, yeah. this, this, uh, this, this autumn or winter then. Uh, yes. Now this is, uh, is this Arabic language that's being written up there? Uh, no, it's actually uh, Dari, one of the main languages. But the point here is the children, people do very heavy work. Uh, they're trying to have draining, uh, draining ditches, you know, um, uh, because the roads... Uh, they, have, they have heavy rains then. Heavy rains and a lot of mud, a lot of dust. Uh, you can see people would use anything. That's a tank, actually. It's an old uh, beat-up tank, but it's used as a store, <laughs> a makeshift a store. Russian tank, probably? Yes, a Russian tank, yes, indeed. Uh, you see that we drove by this place, you know, these streets. Uh, you can see people half demolished. Uh, you know, people would use whatever space there was for living or for business or... A bombed-out building. To, ...to make a living. Yes, um, Kabul and everywhere in the country. And the other thing you see is child labor, you know, children having a very hard life. These children have a responsibility, so the sacks, they have to f find, by the end of the day, they must take home so much uh, fuel, wood, plastic, you know, paper, or whatever. Uh, and garbage, there's no garbage, there's hardly any garbage collection in a, a city of uh, four and a half million people. Uh, and the roads are like this. Uh, only 20% uh, of the roads in Kabul, in the capital, are paved. The, the rest are just like that. This are, these are the teacher education faculty. This is uh, one of the groups, uh, 11 men, 11 women, uh, in this program, the master's degree program that uh, I am uh, uh, you know, helping with. What does a teacher make? A teacher makes, a school teacher makes about um, $100 a month. Uh, college professors could be making from $200 a month to, these are also the same people. They were graduates. Two hundred dollars a month to maybe seven hundred dollars a month. If you, if you have a doctorate degree and you're a full professor, 
you would be making about seven hundred dollars a month. Well, that's, that's but school teachers, government officials, police and soldiers. This is in Nangrahar in the southeast, where it gets like one hundred and fifteen, one hundred and twenty degrees in the summer. But this is a school of five thousand students with no building. So you know they hold. They're lucky. There's there's uh, there are some trees there, and you know the girls can study in the. This is the cafeteria uh, of Kabul Education University, uh, you know, where people can get snacks and eat. Uh, this is the dining hall of the Nangrahar University in southeastern Afghanistan. Uh, you can see, I told the students, why don't you sit properly on the, the benches, you know, in chairs, and they said uh -huh. they're so dirty. We can't sit on them. They oh, will dirty their clothes. So they just put their feet on them. Yes, then. they put their feet on them, and, you know, they eat with their hands because there are no tools and utensils. Um, this is... Right, you know, five, four miles from the Kabul, uh, American Embassy in Kabul, this is one of the classes at Kabul Education University, and that's mold. You know, it's mold on the left. Uh, you know, but that's, you find whatever space there is. Uh, you know, some kind of a flimsy board. This is, again, our group. Uh, our group, of course, we had uh, enough budget to provide a decent classroom and bulletin boards, you know, and heating and uh, air conditioning. Uh, but... Uh, you know, education is terribly substandard. Uh, this is Kabul Education uh, University. Um, you know, it was a very nice facility. This was built by the Russians uh, and now, of course, turned into a university. But you see women dressing in all kinds of ways, uh, you know, and you also see men dressed in national costume or Western clothes or whatever. I thought these, are, these would be uh, interesting. So, uh, again, uh, the master degree students um, these are mostly under 30. These people have known nothing but war and misery. They're all traumatized, Jim. It's really, it's, it's very uh, disheartening to see how traumatized the whole nation is, men and women, children and adults. Uh, and you could see it, you know, because these people, as I said, they have known nothing but war. But uh, 35 years of war or something yes, like that? Yes, yes, yes. And most of these people are under 30. Uh, this is... Uh, this is a bathroom at Kabul Education University, and you can see the uh, sanitation, you know, the filth. Um, there's hardly any water ever, you know, that, and it's, there's no maintenance. And so, uh, you know, everyone is sick, you know, because of the mm, poor lack hygiene. Lack of hygiene, and, yes. And sanitation, uh, you know, and so you have epidemics uh, all the time. Uh, this is... Uh, Dysentery and, and, yes, and yes. typhoid, maybe. Yes. Well, it's a kitchen. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a, another university class uh, in Nangrahar University. Uh, you can see, I think there was one woman in this particular class, uh, all men. Uh, there are about 19% of the university students are women, nine to, 19 to 20% are women. Uh, at the school level, uh, there are more girls, about 39, 40% girls in the elementary and but their numbers decline as you go up in school because uh, they can't go to school because they're afraid or, uh, you know, the families don't allow them or they get mm -hmm. married or they have to, to work at home. So the higher up you go in the education ladder, the fewer the number of girls and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and women. Is the Taliban responsible for some of that? Yes, Keep keeping the them Taliban, from also, yes, they have something to do with it because uh, they look down on uh, you know, uh, women's education and girls' education. Although in some cases now, the government and foreign NGOs have been able to negotiate with them. This is the cafeteria for Kabul Education University. Um, in some cases, they have negotiated with the Taliban to allow um, girls' schools, you know, and, and women's schools. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's one of the secretaries uh, so in Afghan, actually. So you do have electricity occasionally? Uh, yes, although this is generator, so oh, thanks, okay. to, thanks to the U.S. taxpayers. Um, uh, all NGO, you can't rely on public electricity. Again, this is a country where only 13% of the people have electricity, 13%. All the time? They have well, electricity all the time? Most of the time, most yes. Most of the time. But, you know, 85% of the people have no electricity, unless you're wealthy and have a generator. But so all NGOs, all foreigners, buy their own generators, which of course uh, uses a lot of fuel and also creates a lot of pollution. When you say they don't have electricity, you mean they don't, they don't have the facilities for it, 
or they just don't have it. They don't have they it. They have nothing. In. There's no electricity. There's no power there's generating no, uh, because right. the the old system uh, have broken down and uh, excuse me. They import some electricity from Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. The government simply, even though there's a ministry of water and power, but there's very little power or water. Like in this, this picture. This is a beekeeper. Here. This is a beekeeper. Yes, uh, very close to the university. I I became interested in talking to him and this is what he has been doing for 40 years. He travels throughout the country with it, with his bees, you know, and sets up and shops and, and, and produces the honey. Yes. Well, he's yeah. en enterprising man. Yes. Yeah, this, <laughs> uh, this is interesting because this is Kabul Education University. Uh, the classroom used as a storage facility. On the one hand, people complain that there aren't enough classrooms on the other hand, or aren't enough chairs and desks. On the other hand, uh, you know, they've just pile these things in one room and occupy instead of fixing the chairs and using the classroom as a classroom but you know management and and uh, use of resources is very sort of irrational mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is a small uh, repair job at the Kabul Education University putting in paving stones and such. yes yes at uh I don't see any workmen, so... Uh, yeah, they were up, uh, upstairs. Uh, okay. This was, uh, uh, so this is, again, uh, you know, university students uh, in the, the dormitory. Uh, you know, in the dorms, maybe 15, 20 people to a room um, at the university level. 12, 10 people. Uh, no one has, uh, you know, a single room or... Uh, two people sharing. What kind of be bedding do they have? Is it um, minimal, you know, very very austere. I mean, mm -hmm. life is very austere. This is the gym uh, at Kabul Education University. Um, there was very little actually. Uh, I helped them to purchase some of the the equipment. Um, so, you know, the country has no money, and uh, there's also corruption. Money disappears. Uh, you know, it doesn't get to where money is supposed to go. Um, everyone takes a cut. Mm -hmm. Well, at least those are ping pong tables, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and to the left there is uh, there was one basketball hoop and also uh, uh, this is a, a hand pump, you know, because uh, Kabul doesn't really have regular um, running water. They do have wells. Uh, though. But they have wells here and there uh, you know, and with hand pumps, uh, and people sometimes they travel for miles, even in the capital city, up the mountains or down the mountains, or you know, to to get water. And mostly, water is children's job in family. Uh, children mm -hmm. um, are, you know, given the task of getting water, however far or difficult it might be, and whatever the conditions outside, cold mm -hmm. or hot. What's that Japan there? Yes. Is that the yeah. ja a Japanese? This was done by the Japanese. Uh, it was some Japanese institution that had helped with this particular uh, well and pump. Um, and this is the entrance to the Kabul Education University. Uh, as I said, this was built in the late 70s by the Russians uh, as a, sort of a headquarter for their training of their cadres, the Afghan cadres, and then and uh, now uh, it is being made into uh, a university. Mm-hmm. Nice blue sky in the background. It's, uh, it used to be very beautiful. Uh, yeah, this is a dormitory, so you see uh, two, you know, beds are... Uh, the bunk beds? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, bunks and um, very crowded, you know, and there's not enough electricity, so people have a very hard time uh, studying and either there is no library or the library would close at about five o'clock mm -hmm. uh, because there's no electricity that you there's can't no electricity read. but also the librarians uh, they have to go home uh, because people are afraid to go home late especially women after dark people disappear you know people disappear in the city in broad daylight actually uh, I know many families uh, who are very worried about their daughters in particular or women you know Mm -hmm. being kidnapped, abducted, and, and abused. I think that might have been the last of the pictures mm -hmm. there. Yeah, Apparently yeah. it was. Yeah. Well, that gives us a good idea, you know. That it seems to me that I didn't see people laughing and smiling a lot, but mm -hmm. it didn't seem like they were super depressed. I mean, they're resilient. They're, they're bouncing back. They're trying to make it work. 
however the conditions might be, which is, you know, what, what Afghanistan has always, to me, stood for was, was uh, you know, firmness in, 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 in the face of, uh, of a lot of problems because they're kind of at a crossroads there, haven't they been, tried to have been conquered they're for centuries? To be, yes, well, it's called the, the graveyard of empires. Of empires, so, that know, was it, you bet. Alexander yeah. the Great uh, didn't uh, manage to... He went he around there. <laughs> yeah, but didn't manage to really completely subdue the people uh, mm -hmm. The Anglo-Afghan wars, they had three wars uh, in the 18th and 19th, and then the last one was uh, in the early 20th century. The Russians uh, uh, failed to subdue uh, and conquer mm -hmm. and colonize the people. So the Afghans, even though they have differences, they can be very contentious uh, amongst themselves, and mm -hmm. this is sort of a trait. They're very proud people, they're very independent people, uh, and they're very contentious. Um, so they would, you know, argue and fight and so forth amongst themselves, but uh, if a foreigner comes, then they all unite against the, the foreigners. So they pride themselves in being resilient, and the geography is such, Jim, that it's a very difficult place. I don't know why and how they decided 3,000 years ago to settle in the valley. It's a very mountainous country, only about less than 14 percent of the land is arable. The rest are just arid mountains mostly. Some mountains have, you know, j jungles and forests which are being destroyed by the war and, you know, um, um, smuggling, uh, timber cutting and so forth. But it's a very difficult place. The weather is harsh. Uh, it can be very hot. It can be very cold. Uh, it's desolate. Uh, there's water, but the water flows out of the country. Um, it's very mountainous, people isolated here and there. It's very interesting when you fly over it to see, uh, you would think that it's like a moonscape, you know, and then all of a sudden you see a valley and villages and, and towns. Mm -hmm. so, so they do, they, and that's why I think there's just no way that the United States and NATO can really subdue and colonize uh, these people. Uh, I think the sooner a political diplomatic solution is found, the better, mm -hmm. because uh, this, and everyone is saying this, you know, uh, President Obama, uh, Robert Gates, uh, Jim Jones, Iconbury, our ambassador, Petraeus, and all of these people, Stanley McChrystal, everyone is saying uh, there's no military solution, to, but they keep escalating the military <laughs> solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you they know, just keep digging. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, uh, w you know, waste lives and waste money, but uh, the Afghans are very strange people, you know, you, there's you just no way you can colonize them. It's best to talk to them and negotiate mm -hmm. with them and, and see if you can work out uh, some kind of a, a political solution. But yes, uh, it's, a, it's a tribute to their resilience, actually, that they manage to live and continue to live. And, mm -hmm. and you see little children, you see women, you see men, you see old people trying to eke out a living somehow. Uh, you really admire them and respect them for that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the country has been terribly impoverished, and there's a lot of poverty now in, in begging, you know, but you never saw that. You never saw homelessness or people begging. But now the war, unfortunately, mm -hmm. has produced, uh, you know, massive poverty where people are forced to resort to crime mm -hmm. and begging and, and so forth. Well, not only the war, but the occupation. Yes. You know. So, you know, yes. it seems to me what you were saying before about you fly over and see all the differences, you know, the, the, those people, just like any people, are a product of their environment. And yeah. you have the uh, small areas where people can, can f eke out a living over the centuries. Yes. They develop different languages. They develop different customs. That's when you get yeah. the different, the different, uh, I don't know, s tribes and that. Yes. And, 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 and our government is um, trying to use those tribes against each other. Right. And that's just what the, the, the Russians did. But even though it's, it seems to work, that's going to be what eventually makes us fail. Yes, like. well, because, uh, you know, if you, if you pit uh, ethnic groups or religious groups or regional linguistic groups against each other or the so-called modernized sector against the, the rest of the population, um, uh, there's damage being done. You know, people get killed, people lose property, they lose loved ones, mm -hmm. they, know, they lose their stability and sense of security, they lose their religion, they lose the, their language. And I mean, they, the Afghans really do feel under siege. They feel like they're, they're losing, you know, they're losing everything that was dear to them. 
And this makes people very uh, extremist in a way, you know, mm -hmm. rather extreme and fanatic and xenophobic uh, because, uh, you know, these people, they have lost their independence. It's an occupied country. Uh, you know, they've lost their traditional ways uh, through the onslaught of globalization and, and the mass media. Um, there's a fair amount of conversion going on by our soldiers, among other people, you know, uh, foreigners trying to convert Afghans into other uh, religions. Um, they've lost their custom in some way, especially in the cities, like food, you know, um, etiquettes, manners, uh, clothing, and so forth. So people feel like they're under siege, uh, and, and they, under those conditions, you know, you tend to become more xenophobic and more extreme. And you hold on but stronger you, to what you have. Whatever you can hold on to, mm -hmm. but also if some other group does you harm or insults you or robs you of your dignity and so forth, uh, that people don't forget that, you know, and I keep telling my foreign fellows to, to try to reconcile, but also try to harmonize, bring harmony instead of divisions, you know, friction, tension, and, and sectarianism. But the convenient thing now is for the occupying forces to use this against that, you know, or mm -hmm. the other country that are waging sort of proxy uh, war, uh, especially Pakistan and India and Iran and and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Afghanistan, uh, someday these foreigners will have to leave, you know, two years from now, five years or ten years. Then those people will have to settle these scores, you know. So you're really sowing seeds of violence and tension and friction and fragmentation, which is a disservice to, to the society. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, we always try to take the high road, but we're not taking the high road, it seems like, in, in this situation at all. Uh, it doesn't, no, it doesn't look like that because, uh, again, this is like a total war, uh, you know, so we're attacking these people with drones, we're attacking these people with the military, with uh, the CIA, the special mm -hmm. forces, uh, the shadow army, the real army. I mean, this is really massive assault on a population day and night, uh, indiscriminate, you know, and across the border in Pakistan, you know, people don't understand that the border, the Afghans have never accepted the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. The Brits sort of put that border, the so-called Durand Line in 1893, mm -hmm. uh, where they divided the same population, the Pashtuns, uh, half of them in Afghanistan, half in Pakistan. The Afghans, the Pashtuns have never accepted that. So mm -hmm. when the U.S. says, you know, the Taliban use these sanctuaries in Pakistan, those are not sanctuaries, that's where they live. You know, it will be like <laughs> us going to um, California, you know, or Californians coming up, you know, that's not refuge or sanctuary, that's, we're all Americans, that's you know, right. and we go from one state to another because we go, <laughs> we have relatives. Sure. Um, that makes sense. No, we're, we're doing a lot of damage to the society. It's diet, it's environment, you know. A lot of damage is done to wildlife, uh, Jim, and people don't know about this. Some of the most rare species are being um, exterminated, you know, animals, trees, plants, herbs, fruits, mm -hmm. and uh, these, this uh, depleted uranium that is being used. Oh, that's horrible. Especially yeah. in the Tora Bora area. We have we're seeing uh, a lot of birth deformities. Um, like in Iraq, yes, from the yes, war in 91. No. Yeah. Uh, Johns Hopkins and Harvard University and the UN, everybody has documented the deformities. There are many more deformities now, you know, and, and um, deforestation, uh, you know, and also um, Kellogg, Braun and Roots, KBR, is in charge of getting rid of the the, the trash for the U.S. military forces, mm -hmm. and they just uh, burn that in the open. There's no, there are no incinerators. Uh, they burn everything and everything from human corpses to plastic bottles. And in fact, the U.S. Army, the troops have sued KBR in the U.S. courts for causing environmental damage, but also uh, endangering their health, the health of our troops in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. so, so we're doing massive damage, you know to institutions, to the culture, to the economy, to the environment, to the rivers, to everything else. And, and, and meanwhile, we have McChrystal and those folks coming on to the television here in this country and CNN and saying that we can't win this without winning the minds and the hearts of the people. Uh, but what are they doing to do that? But you don't win the people over by um, 
burning trash. Executing them, well, <laughs> executing them in the middle of the night, which has happened just in the last mm -hmm. 10 days, you know. Uh, the UN estimates that last year about 2,400 Afghan civilians were killed. More than half of them were under 18. They were school children. Mm -hmm. And these are civilians. And then half of them are children. You know, they, w they would go in the middle of the night. Either they uh, go into the wrong house or somebody, uh, you know, gave them the wrong information or they suspect something or, you know, the drone took the wrong picture. So, so, so you, you brutalize people. And the country is riddled with American prisons. Not just Bagram, you know, which was the precursor, really, to Abu Ghraib in Guantanamo. I mean, the techniques they used in Guantanamo and in Abu Ghraib were perfected in Bagram first. But there are other prisons. So, so you imprison people. You beat them up. You kill them. You execute them. You bomb them. You take mm -hmm. their loved ones. You destroy, you kill their animals, you know. Right. You destroy their fields. And that's never uh, the end of it there. There's never the end. You know, right. how, what are you supposed, what are they supposed to, to think about you? Mm -hmm. And how can you really uh, expect them to like you or even tolerate you? We could read from the book of Bob Dylan, you know, when you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And, yes. and we're taking away any reason they would have not to come at us. I think we're down to about seven minutes. Yes. We'd like to maybe get a couple phone calls sure. here. Sure, yes, and we, you know, I meant to do this yes. earlier, but this yeah. conversation was just, yeah. just, just so engrossing. And every time you come on, you talk about the same thing, but it's completely... Yes, it's how many more years are we going to be yeah, talking you know, about this? I hope this. it'll be <laughs> in a, you know, it, the American people are the only ones going to be able to stop this yes. war. Yes, yes, You know, because this, this, they're, they're so entrenched just like the Russians were entrenched they stayed mm. over there even though they know it was breaking the back of the country mm. they stayed there until the back of the country was broken it well, seems to me uh, as, the you history know, as you well know and our um, viewers know that war is very profitable mm -hmm. uh, you know in this country I mean there's uh, a whole it's part of the economy now and it's now part of the culture a lot of careers are built on war and mm -hmm. conquest and colonization McChrystal Petraeus you know uh, Obama, Robert Gates, these people, Hillary Clinton, you know, they're in the so-called terrorism uh, industry experts. Right. So war is very functional, unfortunately, in a twisted way. Uh, but just think what we could do with the money, the resources, the intelligence, the goodwill that mm. exists in America mm -hmm. if we use that for positive Right, um, and of course uh, the people up on the, the people up on Top Lake make a lot of money, but there's a lot of people that are you know in production making wages that are making you know whatever mm -hmm. the helicopters or parts for all the yes. different machines and everything that are going over. So yes. it isn't just you know the arms manufacturers; it's right. the people that make all that equipment as yes. well. Well, and, even and, and every, you were, probably every state in the union's got something going on that yes. goes to Afghanistan or Iraq. Yes, yes, you know, and when you're done with your army service, if you work as a security guard for say uh, dine core or a training person or blackwater you can be paid anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars a day mm -hmm. plus That's expenses more than they make in a year yes it, it, more just about what the the highest paid professor makes you said 700 a yes. year or, or a month right? yeah oh yeah uh, yes true it's such a large country and it's such a, a large magnitude of evil that we're doing over there well yes we're not helping this country and we're wasting a lot of lives as I said, you know, about 900 Americans have been killed so far since October. Uh, 12, 13 of them in January thus far. Mm -hmm. uh, about 1,500 foreign troops have been killed, thousands injured, and how many more committed suicide here, you know, or homicide or, mm -hmm. or homeless or messed up on, on drugs. Apparently suicide and these problems are the highest amongst the Afghan and, and uh, Iraqi uh, mm -hmm. veterans of the well, Afghan-Iraqi war. Okay, it's, it, yeah. we've, we've got a... a, a dial tone up there. I don't know if anybody's going to come in on that. We'll get the caller up on the air as soon as we can here. Yeah. Caller, are you there? No, all we got is a dial tone again. Okay, so we should have started this a little bit earlier because sometimes it gets a little bumpy and we haven't been on air for a month now with the, with the holiday closures yeah. and I had a family issue last week that I had to get down to California yeah. and uh, but uh, we got about four, three minutes, three and a half yeah, minutes yeah. left. I really appreciate you coming on and taking time to come yeah. on. And, and uh, I'm really excited that, that this is the program we can get it up onto the internet live yeah. because hopefully, you know, f folks are tuning in. And uh, this this doesn't come as no surprise to me, but I think this would come as great surprise to most of the people in this it country. It looks like uh, I think in this country there's the beginning of uh, a movement to for people to recognize the futility, the immorality, and the uh, 
uh, illegality of this invasion and occupation, which is what it is. That it's immoral, it's illegal, it's uh, unethical, and it's counterproductive. It's not helping. I think some Americans are beginning, in it's Congress, not, public, mm -hmm. you know, the media even. It's only helping the people yeah. up on top. Yeah. I think we're going to try that call one last time here. Hello, <laughs> I guess all, all we're getting is a dial tone. Yeah, yeah we, we, should, we should recognize that fact that, you know, the Obama, we're yeah. not going to badmouth him too much here, yeah. but he hasn't created conditions in his administration that, uh, that allows any, any change in the fact that there's a cream on top that gets all the money out of the wars yeah. and the financial pro problems, the, yes. the home uh, meltdowns, yes. all, all that. There's people that are profiting from yes. that up on top, but the rest of yeah. the country is not. Well, the United States has spent about $230 billion so far in the Afghan war. $230 billion. You know, that's a that's lot of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the estimates are now that we're spending about $5 billion a month. And let's say the U.S. allies are spending another billion, that's six, seven billion dollars a month. Just think what we could do with that money here or there. Uh, here, you know, we're cutting school days, we're closing libraries, uh, you know, people have lost their homes, and one in seven Americans on food stamps, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. children hungry. Uh, um, it's uh, it's madness. Do you, you have, any, have any figures of that six or seven billion? How much of that gets to helping the people get the infrastructure yeah. and the schools and the electricity? Very going? little. Uh, no, the way it's done in, the in Afghanistan, uh, yeah. uh, they say, and people have studied this. Um, if you, the Westerners, the U.S. and NATO are spending ninety dollars for the military operations and ten dollars for reconstruction and development. Mm -hmm you know, um, agriculture, education, healthcare, maybe transportation, so forth. Uh, but that's not enough, you know, $10 versus $90, uh, you know, because war also can be very destructive. It destroys roads, it destroys homes, it destroys schools, it destroys uh, factories, you know, it's, you can see the damage done by war, the economic damage done, other than the psychological and human costs of the war, mm -hmm. but environmentally and economically, War does a lot of damage, and for poor countries, that's deadly. You know, Afghanistan is in no position mm -hmm. to, to recoup or to rebuild. And it also makes it difficult for different groups to communicate. And, and with communicate the, or move or travel oh. or work. You know, you can't do, you can't rebuild anything, your life or the country under war and in insecure conditions. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to leave it there. Yeah. we got about 10 seconds left. Wish we had more time, but... Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. If you're willing to come me. on, we'll do this again real soon. Thank when are you, you going back? Well, I'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> My mother keeps saying, don't come back. Don't uh, come but, back, uh, yeah. uh, All right, well, thanks for tuning in. I want to thank the crew. We'll see you next week. Yes, thank you. Thank you.